Well, guys, we had a couple of speakers. They came, they got, they went, they confirmed. They had a few confirmed. And so when they log on, but I'd love to open it up for discussion a little bit as we get started. Um, Diane, I see you. I see your cameras on. I'd love to have an intro from you while we're waiting for everybody else to get logged on. Thanks, Mandy. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Diane Lightweight, and I have a company called Lightweight Connect, and I help companies um, connect and engage with their target customers, be it B2B, B2C, or direct-to-consumer. And so I've been working heavily in the cannabis and um, space for about three years. I come from, you know, the traditional CPG, um, you know, world. And um, I'm really excited about the hemp space because I'm very much into um, sustainability and the environment. And, and so number one from hemp, I love it from a medicinal standpoint, but then from the environmental standpoint, you know, being able to make clothing out of hemp or, you know, all the different products, you know, building and all that stuff. So hemp to me is going to be, um, really important for sustainability and to help, you know, save our planet. Okay. So as more people are getting logged on, um, Anybody that is, I don't, I don't see if people are logged on yet, um, but in the construction and building space, um, I know that we're going to have a couple come on, log on to chat, but I'd love to intro. I'd really love to talk about this specifically. Um, and Lee, I see you're on. I'd love an intro from you. I see your camera's on. If you'd like to give us an intro, tell us a little bit about what you're working on. It's been a minute or so. Uh, yeah, I'm actually just sitting in as a, as a request from a friend of mine just to learn a little bit more about this. So Awesome. Yeah, thanks. I love it. Yeah, for sure. Glenn, I think Glenn is logged on. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to highlight or give a shout out to that happened in the industry over this last couple of Rich, yes, please. Hello, I was just waving at Glenn. Sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're we're looking forward to work with Glenn uh, a little bit on the hemp blocks as well. So we're we're trying to get that process going. It looks like it's probably within the next month we'll we'll at least have some definitely uh, blocks started shipping and doing in Baltimore. Awesome. Hi, John. Hi, Glenn. Welcome. Hi, oh, hey, Mandy. Hey, everybody. Hey, Mitch. Um, I'd love an update. I was just saying that we've got a couple of minutes while people are logging on. If anybody's got anything that they'd like to share. Yeah, sure. I saw uh, I saw a good post today. It said, um, here's how much lumber you can get for $1,000 compared this this year to last year. And there was a, a photo of a, a good pile of lumber and then the same price now with a little pile of lumber that wouldn't even build a shed. And I'm thinking, okay. How long is it going to take for the mainstream uh, building industry to go, oh, I think we need to look at using other products that are available and actually cheaper. So uh, I was a bit encouraged by that. <laughs> I saw something similar the other day that says uh, it was a truck full of lumber and it says, I hate it when the billionaires flaunt their money. <laughs> <laughs> everything is gone to where is our wealth and it's all around the lumber and building. Well, that would love it. Dave, go ahead. I saw your hand is up. Go ahead. I'd love to hear from you. Well, I actually uh, have some news. Um, we uh, we have uh, received uh, another deposit on a machine. We will actually, it's been a long time. I've been saying it since January, but I think it's for real this time. We will be building the R2 in earnest, and there will be updates and posts videoing the build starting in about a week. So. It's been a long, grueling winter of misstarts and almost starts, but uh, hey, money hit the bank, so we're moving. Good. Congrats. Great. Congrats. Nice haircut, Great. too, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. What is the R2 machine? <laughs> oh. Because we um, don't know acronyms <laughs> here. <laughs> sorry, um, I just assume that everybody's heard me speak before. I apologize. Um, the R2 is a potentially mobile decorticator capable of processing two tons of, uh, uh, of hemp stock per hour. Wow. Um, at a price point that is affordable. 
um, and uh, has lots of other features that are really desirable. Uh, it really is in a class by itself. Um, and if you're uh, interested in a decorticator or know somebody who is, uh, please reach out to me. I'll put my contact info in the chat right now. Okay. Thank you. That would be wonderful. And yes, the answer is yes. We have people who are definitely interested. <laughs> Awesome. So with that, I'm going to do a real quick intro about what we're doing, who we are, for those of you that haven't been on here before. Um, hello to those of you that are or that I recognize. Hi, Erin, and thank you very much for joining. I'm glad to have you. Um, but uh, we built this or I put this together with the intent that you guys have a platform to educate and learn and connect and build relationships. And I love that we've seen a lot of business happening, a lot of connections being made. Um, so. My goal has been to create different groups or meetings that are specific to different topics. And so we host a number of these, 8 to 12 of these a month, all around six specific topics. Today is construction and building materials. There's a few of you on here that I've probably spoken to or that I've asked to get on and maybe share. If I don't have you on the screen, please raise your hand so that I do call on you. Um, today is a little bit disorganized because we usually have speakers all lined up and then things change. So we had to move things around. So um, I know Glenn is on. I'd really love to hear from Glenn. John, I'd love to hear from you and what you've been working on. John, you've got so much experience in the construction space. Aaron, I know you've got lots of questions as um, moving along and me knowing very well that I'm not an expert in this space. So I really created this as an opportunity for you to have time to ask questions. So we can bridge the gap and bring hemp building materials into the mainstream as best we can. Um, it's a pretty diverse group today from people just learning to people investing, people working in supply chain, distribution channels, and so forth. So please don't hesitate to share your contact information in the chat. Reach out to each other. Um, at the end of this, I will send out a link with uh, transcribed notes. And so it'll share the company name, but not personal private information. And then it'll share the, the link to the video on the YouTube channel. So you guys can connect, but if you guys need additional help connecting, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. We are a membership group or um, sponsor. We do have sponsor opportunities. Um, the They start at $500 a month. Membership is $75 a month or $750 a year. It gives you access to all of our events all of our activities, all of our notes, and so forth. Um, other than that, I'd love to turn it over and possibly have Glenn. Glenn, do you mind going ahead and talking a little bit about what you're working on, what you have going, and, and we'll kind of open it up for some questions around hemp blocks and so forth. All right. Okay. For those of you that don't know what we do, we'll, um, uh, we've got a number of uh, organizations Around the world at the moment, we've got Hemp Block uh, USA, Hemp Block Australia, and we're soon to have Hemp Block New Zealand. So we've got business partners in in Europe. Uh, I'm in France at the moment. I met with them uh, last week again, and we are <coughs> currently supplying uh, their products um, into all of those territories that I just mentioned before. Basically, they're a hemp creek block that uh, interlocks. It's dry stacked. It's seventy percent faster than um, normal concrete block blocks and there's a, a reinforcing structure that's, that's incorporated into the uh, walls once they're being built because as we know hempcrete's not uh, it's not uh, load bearing so those blocks are a, a patented design um, the, the factory's been producing them here in France since uh, 2017 and we also have the standard um, uh, it's called multi chamfer but it's just a standard block, 300 by 600 millimeters. Uh, sorry, I don't work in feet and inches at the moment. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's it's really taking off, and um, you know we're 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 uh, actually got a lot of uh, interest in America. We're working with a lot of people in the design phase, engineering phase. Um, we've already built houses in Australia. It's been about probably worldwide 250 houses built built out of these blocks. And uh, also, we're preparing to uh, manufacture in the U.S. Um, over the next uh, 12 months. Um, so that's where we're sort of at at the moment. So pretty exciting times. I mean, I think it's good timing because 
the industrial hemp's being starting to be grown all around the US, so we're a bit concerned about raw material supply. Also, the markets, uh, the demands are increasing as uh, you know projects like uh, Rich and uh, his colleagues pretty excited about those opportunities as well. Um, plus, we're talking to a lot of uh, national construction companies that are really keen to um, you know get this material out on the ground. Plus, a lot of real estate developers. Uh, farmers and others that have decodication uh, factories already existing that would like to have a hemp block factory uh, right next door. So I'm pretty excited about all this. And as I said, I, I visited the factory the other day here, and uh, I must say that I saw it two years ago, but they significantly improved the, the whole manufacturing process. It'll be a totally automated system. The quality of the blocks is just uh, very impressive. There are no other blocks like it. Uh, in the world as far as I know and uh, as I said the main advantage is, is that you know everybody knows about the insulation breathability fire resistance so on and so forth but then the the speed of getting the walls up it actually overcomes all of the inefficiencies with uh, hand breed in situ and I'm not against that but you know you need to look at the portability and at the moment because material prices are increasing everywhere uh, we're seeing that as a an advantage for us because people are freaking out of it. But anyway, I'll stop talking about that. Someone's sound. I don't know if it's a speaker, someone's speaker. If you're on, I think everybody else is on mute. It might be yours, Glenn. It's just loud. Sorry? Can everybody hear Glenn okay? It might be my speaker. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, Glenn, I didn't mean to interrupt you. And I know that there's a couple of other people on. I know that Jeff and Terry, I saw you're both on and both have a similar product or something similar. Um, I don't know the structural side, Glenn. That's one thing that we've presented or talked a lot about before. And I know, Aaron, you had a question about being able to dye it. Is that right? Dye the paver bricks? Um, super interested in hemp block pavers. Can you do red dye colors or traditional high-end roofing shingles? Or traditional high-end roofing shingles? That's a, Glenn, can you dye oh, you're them? Asking, you're asking me. Can you dye the, yeah, uh, and maybe break break that down a little bit about the difference in what you are doing? Well, basically, I mean, you know, the hemp blocks are made from uh, the hemp wood and the uh, prompt natural cement, which is made by our, um, one of our business partners, Dika, in France. <coughs> I mean, at the moment, we're just concentrating on, on what the, the market's demanding, and that's blocks for either veneer applications or walls or um, a load-bearing system. I mean, it is, uh, and what we do is we use um, different coloured uh, renders, uh, lime renders, uh, on the inside and outside of walls uh, to ensure the breathability as well and uh, also ensure that you know you get a good uh, an added value to the insulation but I did have an inquiry the other day where somebody wanted us to make brick pavers well, I said yeah anything's possible because it's really just down to the mould and okay you can put all sorts of additives in it but at the end of the day it's like well I said well is there a proven demand can you provide me some evidence that there's a market demand because if you want to Retool the factory with some molds and stuff. Well, not much point in making stuff if there's not a market demand for it. So we're sort of trying to work backwards from there. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if we could put a uh, fabrication or a manufacturing facility in the US tomorrow, but the market's just not there yet. Because uh, essentially, one uh, one factory, we can make enough blocks to build around about a thousand uh, standard size American homes of about two thousand two hundred square feet. Uh, that's on one. Uh, operation eight hours per day but we can bolster that up to 1.8 million plus we can add additional production lines and increase the, uh, the production as well as the market demand increases so yeah I mean like I said it what we're finding is that okay you can make just a standard uh, solid hemp block uh, no problem anyone could do that like ISO hemp does that in Europe uh, but the the speciality that we've got is that we've actually got blocks that you, that are part of a load bearing system, and also too, the great thing is that a lot of builders we talk to, it's like, oh, this is great. I understand how to uh, construct a cinder block house. It's 
pretty much the same. And I don't need to get any special equipment. I don't need any extra skills. I can just incorporate this into my existing business um, <coughs> operations. And I can build houses faster. I can build more houses and so on and so forth. So, anyway, yeah. You can use um, the hemp block for floors, insulating floors. You can use them for insulating ceilings as well. And so, that's the way. Okay, so there's a couple other people that I'd love to just do a quick intro about what you're doing and then open it up for questions. I know, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind going next real quick about an intro, talk a little bit about what you're working on. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Apodaca. I'm president of Santa Fe Farms. We, um, I run the products and the industrial side of the business. We have over, uh, we're growing over 6,000 acres this year, probably about 50-50, Glenn, on industrial and CBD. Um, we are building out a 240,000 square foot facility here in Albuquerque. We have operations in, in New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, uh, Kentucky, South Carolina, and California. Uh, we're going heavily into the industrial side. Um, you guys have probably had me speak before. Um, Glenn, I'd like to talk to you because we are looking at other relationships uh, within the building materials. Uh, we have a partner here in New Mexico that will be building 35,000 homes in the next 10 years. Uh, our goal is to build 10% of those with alternative uh, alternative building materials made out of hemp. Um, and um, and we uh, we have partnered with Indian country around the around the country, um, 16 of the largest Indian nations that have over 50,000 acres and water. Um, and so we know we can expand, and we're going very heavily, very heavily into building materials, into carbons and stuff like that. And we know we're not the experts across the board. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're based in New Mexico. Our, our facilities is here um, in Albuquerque and in New Mexico. It's one of the fastest growing um, states in the country now. Um, and uh, there's a 1600 square foot industrial park being built in Southern Albuquerque, um, the largest industrial park in the country. Uh, and again, they're building a community with 35,000 homes, with 10 builders. We have relationships with all 10 of the builders. So in our own backyard, we are in the process of building out uh, multiple facilities across the board for multiple building materials and um, and and carbon and industrial products. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we do. Uh, we have relationships with not only do we own our own farms, we have relationships across the country with multiple farmers across the board. Uh, we're heavily into the CBD business right now because I think everybody knows that's kind of where the industry is right now. Um, but we we feel like it's, we're going full throttle. As I say that, between our our federal, state, and our private lands, you know, we we can scale up um, tremendously when we need to and when we're prepared to. So that's that's a kind of a recap of Santa Fe Farms. But um, the industrial and the building side is very interesting to us. We have multiple relationships already. Um, we own some of those rights and we partner with other other people doing that because we know that there's, and that's why Mandy and I have been talking so much because we know on her day-to-day -day or weekly calls, there are many opportunities uh, between everybody, of uh, every every one of us on the call um, that we can kind of move forward on that. So um, saying that we are in the process of building out multiple facilities around the United States, um, specifically targeting building materials. So. Glenn, I'd love to talk to you about that. In fact, I saw your guys' product and reached out to uh, reached out to you guys a, f a few months ago. Um, uh, but, yeah, I, sorry, I just I, I actually phoned you earlier and left a message on your phone service. As, um, okay. Yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> so, let's do that. Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds very exciting, and I'd be happy to have a discussion and see what we can do to work together. Sounds good. No, definitely, and uh, and just everybody knows we 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 knew that the corticator. Uh, the cortication was the, the bottleneck. Uh, we have invested heavily into the cortication. Uh, we have decorticators already in Colorado coming to New Mexico soon. We have already ordered uh, additional decorticators. Um, and and one of, that's going to be one of our big, the supply chain will not be an issue for us because not only are we growing industrial, uh, specifically this year yeah. and next year, uh, but we'll be in the decortication business. Yeah, Mandy, sorry. That's okay. I, I I know that you're under a little bit of a tight spot in not being able to share a lot about the specifics for types of products that you're working on. I have a lot of people on this call. I know Aaron's got some questions that really want to dive into 
the feasibility of investment to be able to bring it into mainstream, right? For some of these others that have end products, I know Terry, you're on here also that wants to talk, or we had spoken previously. Terry, are you available to come off mute and share what you're working on, what you have? Oh, certainly. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Mandy. I appreciate it. Um, yes, uh, I'm Terry Radford, president of Just Biofiber Structural Solutions, and we make a modular hemp building material uh, as well. And uh, it's it's a it's an exciting industry for use of hemp products because of uh, we use large amounts of hemp herd in the manufacturing process. So it's great to see uh, Glenn on here as well and other manufacturers that have hemp-based building materials, because this is what it takes. And you have to get critical mass in the building industry uh, to get some traction and a foothold. And it's a very, very large market. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a trillion dollar industry. So uh, we welcome, you know, other people making hemp products. Uh, there's lots of room in the marketplace for sure, but attracting uh, investment into the, uh, into the building materials, the hemp building materials, uh, it requires a lot of money because you're a manufacturing business. So factories start at $10 million and work their way up, depending on you know production volumes. And so it's a matter of having markets. So Glenn was bang on when he, and same with Jeff about, you know, uh, having customers first uh, and then proving the building materials uh, and testing and certification. It's a, it's a long road to uh, market acceptance. So investors want to see sales first. Uh, am I correct, Jeff? Oh, I agree with that. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry, I was on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Jerry, I, I agree, and and uh, and I think between both your guys' products are, are great products. I think, like you, I, I agree with everybody. I think there's plenty of room to grow. Uh, you know, we we see with the local builders that we're dealing with, the United States and Latin America, that uh, you know, wood products continue to go up, concrete continues to go up. Um, there's major issues on that. So any alternative, and then there's specific states, specifically New Mexico and some of the southwestern states, they're very aggressive with alternative building um, uh, credit, uh, uh, tax credits uh, for ourselves and for building opportunities. So we have a bunch of investors that are really looking into this, and uh, we're fortunate where the economies are kind of turning around, um, coming in, coming out of COVID. Um, there's a sh we know for a fact there's a shortage of affordable housing and housing out there um, tremendously. So I think with our relationships and hopefully all three of us, we can help grow this industry across the board. Okay, so I, I'd really like to open this up right now for some discussion and some questions. You know, my goal in doing these is to help us bridge the gap with a variety of people on here who are, and Jacob, I saw you're a perfect person to jump in on this. <laughs> if you don't mind introducing yourself as well, yeah. Yes, I'm the president of the U.S. Hemp Building Association. Right now, we're a collective of different people across the industry. Um, our big focus is right now our, our standardization through ASTM to get our performance standards certified and have a clear path for that. We're also working with a group to, to define the PCR and to uh, then get the evaluation of the environmental capabilities all put together. We're also collecting a bunch of data, uh, basically all the research papers we can find on hempcrete and then trying to distill that down. Um, we also building a map of buildings and a supply chain map for members of the organization. So you can help distribute your information, uh, primarily made up of people in the industry at this point. So a lot of builders that need connections, a lot of people are just jumping in and, um, uh, working together collaboratively. So all you people that just talked, everyone, if you want to join us, please do. Um, I'll put my stuff in the, in the chat again. Thank you. I uh, got a question there, Jacob. Yep. Um, I suppose the the thing is with the with the code compliance and the standards. I mean, the blocks that we've got, they're totally accredited, tested, blah blah, comply with all the Euro European standards, and the accredit accreditation agency is part of the ILAC, the International Association of Testing Laboratories, and. My understanding is if, if, if a, a country has got signatories to that particular agreement, well, then those, those accredited tests are valid in countries, including the United States. Is that correct or not? So from my understanding, there's been some issue with people using test reports coming from Europe and other countries 
I think it primarily comes down to the fact that all those standardizations are created with EN tests. So those are European standard testing methods. So there's been some domestic pushback that they're not American testing standards. That's why we're doing this to kind of just make the direction to ASTM and like get that cleared up because that seems to be the big issue. At the same time, you hit the right permitting office, they'll have no problem. Um, as far as ICC codes, it's not in the ICC codes right now. So that's the International Code Council. And we're working to get it added in um, as a uh, appendix, very similar to straw bale and um, straw clay, but the deadline for that's January, 2022. So we have a large push right now to get through the ASTM part, get the testing standards set up, and then get the documentation into the ICC so that we can be in the American codes, if you will. Yeah, because um, with our system, we're finding that it really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. So like in Australia, for example, we've got one building code and 547 local governments that administer the building code. So you know, it really gets down to, okay, the engineer, structural engineer has certified the structure because okay, the superstructures are uh, the uh, reinforcing of the concrete, and then the hemp block adds the rest of it to it. But, um, yeah, we haven't really had a problem in Australia, and so far in the United States, um, I'll talk to, I want to ask Jeff later on, we've actually got a project happening in New Mexico, and they need some engineering support there. But, um, yeah, it seems to be happening similar in the United States, where it's a case-by-case -case basis, as you said, depends on the state, depends on the certifier, so on and so forth. But I sort of think that, you know, yeah, there's probably going to be some hurdles, but I don't see it as a really big issue, but uh, it depends on, you know, who you're working with and, and so on and so forth. So, anyway. so from my understanding, when you talk about some of the roughest permitting areas, which is Florida and California, there's rules in place where you can use an alternate material if it can be proven to perform better or greater than the current material. So that's how you can usually get through in most areas. Okay. But putting it in the codes, it'll simplify it even further. And that's really what our goal is at this point. Um, okay. There are state-by-state state codes, but usually they'll follow what the ICC does. Okay, well, I look forward to uh, all your good work. If I may, uh, the best way to get through some ICC code process, but a lot of people don't like to do this because they feel passionate about their patents, but the best way to get through is to team up with a college, and the college will actually speed the process through. Uh, Miami is the best college to work through through this process. So if somebody just would love to get hemp onto the, pro the, the process, you already have a patent, team up with the college, and they'll push it through and we can get to market quicker. So there's two sort of things when you look at ICC. One is like ICCES, which will qualify a single product. And the other is a more general acceptance of hempcrete. And that's what we're looking at. But you're right, ICCES path, that's a private company that does that, but also working with the university is a similar path. First thing yeah, well, just the just the other comment I've got is that you know all the accreditation is specific to the uh, multi shelf and the biosystem and which is the which is the hemp block. It's not specific to hempcrete in general, which I understand what you're saying is the ASTM stuff is hempcrete in general, where as all of our accreditation is specific to our block because we don't use a line binder. We use something else totally different, or not totally different. It's fifty five percent line, but you know, like in Australia, we said, well, hang on, you can't lump us in with just hempcrete the same as all hempcretes because, you know, there are hempcretes and there are hempcretes. You know, there are oils and oils, whatever the ad was you used to. But, so uh, when, yeah. oh, sorry. Uh, so when, when we're defining it in the ASTM process right now, you're defining the hempcrete, the mix itself by three basically variables. The hemp herd specifications, which is another ASTM group that we're working on to get that defined in this country, basically the testing methods that will be required. And then we're probably going to have, well, whatever. Um, but right now we're working on the testing methods to basically say um, the issue would probably be, again, the ICC. You have accreditation from another country. If ICC accepts it, that's great. Um, but with the binder variable, so sorry, it was hemp herd specs, binder, and then ratio of ingredients. Um, with the binder variable, we're not even defining it as line-based. It can be anything. So we're just defining it as this is one of your variables. Because when you define your sample, you're going to have to define your mix and then define your application process. So we're we're having a base 
section of these are what the mix is, then there's actually going to be three different specifications for precast, spray in, or cast in place. And that's where we're at right now. And then we'll try to get those approved. And then we're going to have to go through a, a series of test cycles to show that people can follow these standards and get the same results in different places. But so, that's, so does that mean that we'd have to do specific tests in the US according to whatever your standards are? Or can we use the, can we say that, okay, the tests that we've done meet your standards? Depends on the test. So the, the biggest problem with European standards versus American standards, and this is not saying they're even different, but the thing is they could be different. Like I could use a testing method that uses like hot plates over here and I could use a hot box over here. And thus the results would be different and aren't really comparable. And that's why in general, there's there can be a resistance against accepting EN codes. It's not that the data isn't accurate. It's where they tested the same. Yeah, okay. No, I mean, that was my understanding of that international laboratory association of testing laboratories that they actually everybody in that association agrees that they'll accept the tests uh, like in New Zealand for example standards in New Zealand will accept the tests that were done in France and the same in Australia as well but it sounds like it's a bit different in the United States I, I honestly don't know enough about those relationships with ASTM that's um, that's really the question uh, my understanding is there's some there's a relationship with the ICC building codes and Canada's building codes there's some relationship there that's like a quid pro, like if you do it, we do it. But I don't know about international. And um, so I, yeah, sorry. Okay. So any other questions? There's lots of other questions that I think the standards, this, this comes up a lot. One thing that came up a lot that during registration, um, for those of you that are producing product, is wondering about specifics for the size or the cleanliness or the... So what is what is it that you need from the decorticators for your products? You know, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what who wants to or if somebody can speak to that a little bit. Okay, uh, sorry to. Read. That's okay. I let let me see if I don't know Terry or Jeff or um, Glenn if you guys have any input or anything that you'd like to share, Terry. Uh, yeah, uh, I've actually been working with the guys at, uh, with Jacob and his group and also through the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, which is our national uh, hemp association. Uh, we are carrying on testing uh, by the association on behalf of uh, all the different hemp building material groups. And the ASTM test numbers are compatible with U.S. and they're, you can put those into the International Building Code, the IBC, uh, as well. And they do trans, they, they will cross over to EN codes uh, for European standards. Um, so that's kind of what we've done here is, uh, you know, Canada has been growing hemp for the last 20 years. And uh, so we're a little more advanced as far as standards go. So we have developed standards for quality of like of hemp herd and hemp fiber for different applications. And those standards uh, get sent to the processors and the manufacturers can use those standards when ordering product to define what exactly, like what, what it is they're looking for. So standards is the first thing. Uh, and those standards have been set up in, in France for quite some time as well, uh, like on the raw hemp materials to be used in, in yeah, further yeah. I mean, they, manufacturing they processes. Strict standards in France for the hemp herd uh, the quality that they require because, as you probably know, it, it really relates back to the quality of block you can do then because um, they were initially doing using different standards, but they've changed in the last two years and they've got a better product. Yes, and the designs that the standards can be, uh, each manufacturer can specify their own standards. There's no fixed standard saying that, you know, hemp herd has to be a particular size or uh, reading, reading amount or whatever. It's each manufacturer will decide what works best in their process, but they can order. From like the the hemp herd, for example, for making hempcrete to their specifications, uh, it, it's not going to be dictated uh, by the standards committee. It's just the rating system of particle distribution sizes, cleanliness, color, you know, all those other factors. Well, that's kind of what I'm what I'm curious about is well, what are we looking at so that those that are on the processing side or building these processing facilities, you know, what are those standards look like? Brian, go ahead. 
I'd like I saw your hands up. Go ahead. Uh yeah. Uh what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be doing that processing operation. We're probably starting up in Texas and uh doing about eighty eight thousand tons of material. You're pretty uh in the relatively near future as we're doing the money break, we're about to enter the design phase of our facility and we need to know these specifications because one of the things that I want to do is have to target my material coming out of my machine to be uh geared towards the hemp fiber uh, to to the hemp building materials market over you know, other markets such as textiles. Um, and one of the things that I would like to see is black and white specifications of companies that are working with these hemp creek materials for the herd material that they need. I'm seeing ranges from uh, anywhere, but it seems to be that the most uh, predominant seems to be about three eighths of an inch to about half inch uh, pieces de-dusted, which our material will be. Um, it will be under vacuum. Uh, under all phases of the operation being transported by negative pressure from station to station for a multi-stage decortication and cleaning uh, and come out the other side uh, with less than 3% uh, fiber material attached to the herd and uh, also completely de-dusted. Uh, the, so basically the same industry standard for materials such as Canabac coming out of France is what we're able to what we're here for. But I don't have a specific particle size for that hemp, and that's one of the things that I need to get to my engineers. Uh, so, if you, any of you gentlemen, um, have that information. That is information that I sorely need before I begin construction. <laughs> well, and I think this is something that comes up often, right? And I know also respecting those that are holding it to their chest. Um, I know it's a tricky subject, but. What can be discussed or what is discussed? Um, you know, this is where I'd love I'd love to open this up so that we can provide some of that to some of our decorating. Well, I mean, in my case, we're prepared to, to release that information once we've actually got our some of the other things locked down about getting the manufacturing organised and then working out supply chain and stuff. So, I mean, at the moment, I can't can't really disclose that, but we're more more than willing to do that when we know that. When we're going to get stuff on the ground, and when we'll be requiring the raw materials from people like yourself, Brian. Where are you based, sorry? Brian? Uh, we are going to be headquartered in the Austin, Texas area, and we are shopping around for different sites for our first facility right now. But the likely winner of that is going to be in the Lubbock and Amarillo area. Uh, we're going to have close proximity to hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland that is predominantly cotton, which is the same type of soil that hemp fiber also loves. We're going to be going there, uh, targeting farmers who are not very happy with the rotational crop and trying to, trying to see if we can't get them to pick that, to get that rotational crop spot and not the main crop. Um, and we are conducting, I am, uh, funding two different seed trials with the Texas Hemp Growers Association and Texas A&M trying to, do, trying to figure out which strains are going to be working the best in that area. We have a lot of hope for the uh, Australian strain, uh, uh, MS-77, I believe we go fiber. Okay. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, Texas is one of our target markets, obviously, because, you know, nearly half of the building permit approvals in 2019 for just Residential construction was in Texas. I think it was four hundred and sixty yeah. thousand. So I believe I believe Texas in the United States is probably going to be a major launching pad for the hemp fiber construction materials. Precisely right. why I've actually started this facility up in this state. You got Panda Biotech there as well, haven't you? Uh, yes, Panda Biotech there uh, is also here. Uh, Wichita Falls are going to be well outside the radius to uh, of us, so we won't have to compete with the farmers with them. But also, I believe their main focus is going to be geared towards the textiles and so much as the uh, machinery that they purchased, which is LaRoche machinery. Uh, I don't believe that they even have the capability of processing or herd fiber. Okay. Well, it's interesting to know. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, I mean, look, strategically what we're looking at doing is, okay, we're all about trying to reduce the embodied energy of production and stuff like that. So yeah. to me it makes great sense if we can actually locate a uh, production facility between the supply of raw material and the demand centre, and then we're actually assisting that area to generate the economy by you know, yeah. buying, buying stuff off you, creating jobs and so on and so forth. Because... Yeah. I mean, I don't see any point in putting it in a mega factory to produce 10 
50 million blocks a year, that's pointless. It's like it's far better. It keeps in uh, with the theme of what I think it's all about anyway. It's like, okay, we're trying to reduce CO2 and all sorts of other environmental stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you know, Texas is one of the target areas. So uh, once we're ready to go, quite happy to uh, you know, have, a, have a discussion about it. Uh, please do. Uh, my information, my LinkedIn information, I posted during the chat here. Uh, okay. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, feel free to add me to the network and send me a message anytime. Also, okay. I'll post my email here so anybody can. Okay, cool. Hey, uh, Brian, I was, was going to say, Brian, I'll reach out to you too because we have a lot of things going on, on in West Texas and obviously the east side of New Mexico. So I think there's some synergy between all three of us, to be honest with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Let's get together and cooperate on some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, like Terry said, you know, there's uh, the market's huge. I mean, if we put uh, 10 manufacturing facilities in the US, the amount of blocks we'd make, that's like 3% of the entire, you know, construction markets. It's nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good business, but, uh, you know, it's not that huge. Well, and I do want to I do want to say something, but I, I'm not. It's not like we're flush with cash right now. We have raised a substantial amount of money in our in our A round. And uh, we're looking to raise some additional capital to ex not only expand our operation, but to on calls like this to look at opportunities that we can bring people together and us having the capital to help expand this industry across the board. Um, so just be very aware at Santa Fe Farms, as we continue to grow, we're finalizing our, our preferred A round. And, um, and there will, we, are in, we are very aggressively looking for partnerships um, not only in the industrial side and the, and the building side, but on the carbon side also. So just, I just want everybody to know that, that you'll, you'll see us around a lot more. So just, just be aware of that as we continue to grow our own ourselves. Okay. And I would like to encourage everybody here, uh, do absolutely everything that you can to go after, uh, the, what we would call the easy money or the low cost money first before we immediately send your operations over to DC. Uh, we have done a significant amount of hunting. Uh, we have done a good investment in, uh, um, 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 it's space in here, a preliminary prospectus, uh, leading into a private placement memorandum. Those things going through the more professional and SEC compliant, uh, entities. Uh, and doing that, uh, we've actually come across a lot of opportunities, uh, for industrial revenue bonds, uh, Local, uh, local incentives for setting up in these areas that we're talking about where we can basically revitalize, uh, these kind of dying economies, uh, especially in these agribusiness areas where, you know, textiles and mills and all that stuff have been shut down. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity right there. We're actually seeing that with our, uh, projected raise, which is approximately around the area of about 25 million, uh, we're actually have a possibility of raising all of this money with government grants and all of these other uh, uh, programs without having to go to D.C. and giving up any control of the company. So do your due diligence, do your work, uh, get a hold of professionals that know how to track this down. Don't try to, don't try to cut any corners. It's going to cost you a little bit of money to, to find that money. But with that, there's going to be a whole lot less screens attached to it. And I would encourage everybody to go that way rather than immediately seek D.C. I wonder how many of our VC guys on this call are excited about that. <laughs> I'm, not saying, I'm not saying you won't have to go to this. I'm saying that make it, you know, get, you know, large, there's, three, large. there's three tiers of your money. There's the government grant, and then there's your liens, and then whatever you need left after that, seek after VC. Now, VCs mm -hmm. are always, the VCs are always going to make money. But, uh, well, and I have to, I have to say that right, there's, we're starting to see a lot of the public private partnerships being formed, like you said, with universities and the you know, money coming in from the government. And I think that there are opportunities. Um, in fact, we're going to do one um, specifically around the VA and the bring bill in to open up opportunities to the USDA. Um, so yes, I, I do. I validate what you just said. As far as that goes. Yeah. Well, uh, we're doing we're doing both. So any VCs on this call, you're welcome to talk to us. Yeah. Well, okay. So when we talk about this, you know, opportunity. This uh, this comes to me a lot, and I feel like I'm the deer in headlights sometimes. So I want to talk about, um, especially you guys, what is opportunity that's really available on the investment side? So there's 
a lot of questions that come up in how do we educate or what type of education can we bring to the investment side um, so that we can really bridge that gap and move from here. Topic really quick. Uh, Please, so, Aaron. do you uh, mind introducing yourself? I know that you meant spoke earlier, but absolutely. So, my name's Aaron Peterson. Um, I have a background in logistics. I've been in it for about all since I was a little kid, but um, I've done. I've done uh, containers on barge down the river in both Europe, uh, Asia, and as well as the U.S. Um, we do worldwide distribution. Primarily, what my my families uh, hired me for is to take their assets to market. And so, you know, at the very beginning of the call, when you said, you know, the billionaires are spending their cash, those are a lot of my clients. But they're just they're everyday people that just got lucky and settled the West faster than anybody else. To be honest, uh, they go through very stringent rules and everything else, but they want to invest and deploy their money. And so. I just want to throw this out there before we get into the investment conversations that happen, because too often in these great times, I see people get on here and we're not allowed to talk about investments at different stages. But here's the biggest thing I can tell you that's really nice. And, and that's just because of an accredited investor thing, right? And so it's not super hard to become an accredited investor. The fastest way that most people do it, by the way, is they go out and they buy mineral source and they get a future production contract. You guys are all on hemp. And so you'll get you'll get there quick. So then the conversation. And so what I would recommend personally is. Mandy, it's amazing what you've grown. I remember when there was four people on this call, four, and now you have three pages of Zillow or, 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 or Zoom, and it's, it's un unreal to me. So it's just amazing. The, the industry is awesome. Um, I love what a friend of mine said once, and, and that was, Aaron, we don't attack anybody in the industry because the industry is so large and there's such a massive need, and I agree with all of them. Um, and so the biggest thing I would say is I think that you guys have reached a phase where you should probably split your call. And so what you should do is go out to SPB. This is what I mean, though, okay, right? Go out to SPB, get an SPB. It's 2,500 bucks if you go through a sure, and, do, and they'll do all the legal side for your special purpose vehicle. And they'll make sure that for 2,500 bucks, they'll make sure that you literally do it right and you don't get in trouble for regulations, laws, and all that type of thing. Now, what we can do, which is nice, is there's a new Reg CF that just came out for crowdfunding. It used to be a million dollar cap. Well, now it's five million dollar cap. So I, I hear that it's ten million dollars to, to start a facility. Unfortunately, what you can't do is mix two crowdfunding uh, uh, loans together to raise for your for your raise for ten million. So if we could get the 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 facilities down to a five million dollar cap, it'd be so easy to raise a crowdfunding Reg, and that's no different, by the way, than a token or a cryptocurrency. It's the same thing as raising a reg CF. It's just a different, newer word for the financial model, if that makes sense. And so um, I help companies do all these things. I, what I specialize in is these families have kids and these, their kids want to spend their money, but it's all tied up in fancy trust funds with special tax things and all these stuff. And so they want to spend the money and they want to do these hemp products, just like all of you. And so what I, what I specialize in is working with that individual. I get on a one hour call with them. And I'd literally go over their customer problems, everything, and I put them onto an executive summary. There's one on my page. If you just go to uh, uh, AaronPeterson.life, you land on an executive summary page. Okay, I do a one-page executive summary for people to help you raise money through either a Reg CF or through an accredited investor fund group. And there's two of them. There's a big one out of Mexico right now that uh, literally groups are trying to hedge against inflation. So what are they doing? Well, everybody sees lumber triple. So they literally are raising massive funds, these families, just so they hedge against inflation by buying lumber. And they, they care about one word, lumber or timber. That means hemp too. I think too many people in this industry call it hemp. If you didn't say the word hemp and it was chipboard, they wouldn't care. If you said MDF and it was chipboard, they wouldn't care or MDF. But too many people say hemp and I can buy boards. I can't buy hemp yet because there's no structural UL, there's no structural, all these things. And so if we stopped referring it to that and we referred it to the input products, we could go to market much quicker. But as soon as it becomes hemp, then the investors question exactly what we just talked about. And so last thing I'll, I'll end with is every community in, uh, in America is built under something called PDIs. You should research what a PDI is because if you understand what a PDI is, you are going to be able to do very, very well. And so I'll give you an example. In Utah, where I'm from, I, I live in the same state as Mandy. She's an amazing individual, by the way. She does amazing on stages when she's out there. So there's a, uh, a group here called the Sorensen Family. They just finished a 6,300-acre PDI development. They annexed a piece of their property into uh, the Wasatch up, up in Heber. 
They raised $170 million to build the neighborhood on future taxes. I mean, that's how the whole building industry works. But we ha- and under those, we can do really creative things where if hemp captures carbon, we can go out and we can get special GHG credits. And so uh, the gentleman that's up on the left next to me, um, spot on that, that's moving to Texas, of, of all these things that exist, grants and all these stuff, things, and even the big wealthy families that have VC funds, they want to do it through grants. They would much rather redistribute their wealth than pay taxes. And that's why taxes are amazing is because it helps people put their wealth into production. So anyways, that's all I have. Uh, if you'd love to reach out, I'd love to talk with you uh, one-on-ones if anybody would like to. Um, and I, I give everybody a free first hour. So just give me a call and book my schedule. I'll be happy to talk. All right. Uh, real Can quick, I saw you? the other Aaron camera come on because you're in your shop, I see. Um, do you want to introduce yourself real quick, sir, and tell them a little bit about what you're working on, especially being in the wood business? Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Rydell uh, with uh, Hemp Engineered Manufactured Products. We have a home goods line, uh, hemphomesales.com. And uh, speaking about collaboration, uh, I see Greg Wilson's on here from Hempwood as well. And uh, we work with uh, the lumber that Greg produces in Kentucky. Um, we get his raw logs shipped to Colorado. And we've actually been building a, a line of products, actually. I've got some here behind me. Uh, we're doing some home goods, uh, just putting hemp in people's hands and uh, kind of trying to remove some of the stigmas that uh, are associated with it. So we started out with a line of home goods. We've just got some Lazy Susan, some cute little things to show everybody what we can accomplish. Uh, we go all the way up to coffee tables, um, interior trim. I uh, was just measuring a couple offices yesterday for some friends in the hemp industry to, to hemp up their, their office space. Uh, we're really excited about the potential in the building uh, industry for these products. Uh, the shiplap and the trim don't really require a lot of the ANSI testing that we need for the building codes. So it's a great way to get it in initially as we develop the products that might end up in the structural aspect um, you know, moving forward. Greg, would you like to thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you for giving Greg a shout out as well. And by the way, um, it means a lot to me when you guys highlight people that are doing it right. So please don't ever ha- hesitate to give someone a shout out or, you know, holler and we'll call on them to hear from them. I don't know everybody on the call all the time as much as I'd like to say I do. So I do appreciate when you guys do that. Greg, go ahead. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. So, um, this is Greg Wilson from Hempwood. Uh, I'm here at the factory. You can see it's operating right now outside the window here. Um, we've been making Hempwood for a couple of years now. It's just starting to gain traction. Here's the office. Here's the people doing what they do. Some of the different home goods. Not the same stuff that Aaron and the boys out in Colorado do. But we have some of their goods here. Like his lazy Susan he was talking about sits in the office here. Um, we're just setting up our second facility. So the power got turned on last week. So we have our own flooring in-house. So we have two hemp fiber manufacturing facilities in Murray, Kentucky. We have about uh, somewhere between 20 and 25 people, depending on who's starting and who's quitting and COVID and all that stuff. Um, our footprint is actually pretty small with the amount of hemp that we use. We only use a few hundred acres. Um, I doubt we get to a thousand acres this year and that's just fine for what we do because we can make a million board feet of lumber out of that. So it doesn't really take these enormous setups that I keep hearing about. Um, If you start small, it seems to work a lot better. And then growing the smaller setups to have multiple locations has always been better for me. Um, This is my 57th one of these facilities, actually 58th uh, since we got two of them now that I've set up. Uh, I was doing it with bamboo in China. So we did 53 bamboo plants. We did three recycled wood plants in Europe and Australia. And then um, now I got hemp wood here in Murray, Kentucky. So if anybody is looking for lumber or flooring, um, just give us a shout. You can find us hempwood.com. We got lucky and picked up that domain name probably five years ago. And we have all the different, oh, you can see there's trademarks on it and we've got patents in all the different countries and it'll end up being a really big deal um 
we've got all these different franchising programs and uh, dealer programs and retailer programs and factory reps. So if anybody's looking to get into the hemp industry and they want to kind of test the market before they try to set up a manufacturing facility, just give us a shout. Or if you're looking to put it in your office or your home or anything like that, um, you get a hold of us. If you need any of the other home items besides your flooring and lumber, then give Aaron and the boys a call because they're actually better woodworkers than us. Their craftsmanship is better for those more detailed items. We do lumber, flooring, a little bit of furniture, a little bit of cabinetry. But our main thing is just how many board feet of lumber that we can bring out of here to go into finished goods. Awesome. Awesome. Dave, I saw your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I really wanted to say thank, thank you, Greg, for voicing that. And not to take anything away from larger operations. Obviously, the decorticator that we make is geared to smaller operations. And I believe that that, that really is urgently required, uh, not only because of the geography of North America being so spread out, um, but also to realize the main benefits of hemp. Things have to be regional and local, and things have to start small. And uh, if you happen to be in Wichita Falls and you have all of that agri land right in your backyard, well, wonderful. And if you have the the financing to do that, again, wonderful. But, you know, I get calls every day from people who are saying, I want to do something. And, uh, and it's really important that we all realize that people can do something on a small scale and grow into a larger operation, whether it's making hemp wood, whether it's making hempcrete houses, whether it's making decorticators. Um, Small is kind of key for us to realize a true green benefit, especially everyone's talking about the green restart. Well, <laughs> we've got the perfect opportunity to do those kinds of things here and now. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, Aaron, I saw you had a comment you made about wanting to affiliate or connect with Greg. Um, any, any other questions, especially about, you know, really focusing on bridging this gap? Do you have questions okay. about... So I have something that I love that Greg said, and, and Greg, it's awesome that you do the affiliate thing. Um, somebody that I work with a lot on here, he's on here, Curtis, he's a, a partner of mine in some other uh, wood developments that we're doing in alternative materials as well right now. Um, and we, we can't talk about where those ones are coming from for the same reasons and everything else. But um, but here's what I'd say is, is everybody that's in this market, I love what Greg said, and you should take him up on that because... What people do too often is they think they have to go out and raise the money to build a product to then go to market. And really what they need to do is they need to flip the funding backwards. If you go out and you find somebody that would buy the material and they didn't care what it was, they knew how to deal with the local city that would approve the material. They know how to uh, uh, get the contract and they'll write you a PO. If you can get a PO. It's easy for us to go and get you financing. There's people that will write you checks all day long for what's called a future production contract. So, Take the process and flip it backwards. Go find the people that will do it. And here's what I would say. I love that Greg does flooring too, because great, flooring is an easy one. I mean, who doesn't want hardwood floorings and floors in America? Maybe he does, you know, kitchen cabinets, or maybe he does all these things. And you literally could pull up, if you go into Google and you type in kitchen cabinet trade show dot XLS, it'll probably pull up every company you could call. You could literally call them, sell them hemp wood, figure out what Greg's rates are. And then do it backwards. And then as you're getting into the product lines yourself, it would be much easier. And so the biggest thing is I wanted to get on because I'm excited. I really want to write contracts. The contracts that I can write right now is if anybody has, I put a couple of notes in there. If anybody has the wood that I literally can make kitchen cabinets with, my my uh, one of my partner groups, they literally do all the machines that make the automated machines for kitchen made. If you have a kitchen made product you've ever bought, my friend's machine company called Ram or Pillar Machine probably made your cabinets. And so if you can supply knockdown wood for things that aren't structural, that aren't building construction, it'd be a really good way to open up hemp, I believe, into the market. And I can write contracts that are bankable, right? And it's all about doing a PO, then getting the fulfillment and then banking them. And so I would even recommend the investment bankers that you could go to to make sure they're bankable. And so think about trim and other products right now until we get those UL ratings and, and that'd be awesome. So as far as questions go, my biggest question is just, if you are in an alternative product and you can supply an alternative product, please drop me a message. I would love to report back to Mandy that we got some contracts out of these calls 
and uh, are helping the industry. So, hmm. yeah. So here's your cabinets right here. So we have these are just my love it. They Perfect. go to uh, cannabis shops, hemp shops, stuff like that. When they have the open front where we have acrylic in there instead of glass, so you don't have the cut risk. If you're in someone's shop and you cut your hand because they have glass in their cabinet, that's actually a big no-no. Um, and then we have the wood front cabinets as well. And those go into, I have them in my own house. So yeah. cabinets are already there. It just needs more cabinet makers to use the hemp wood. They look incredible. And here's the thing is, I got the cabinet makers. So if you have the knockdown wood or the product to do it, we, I can push it out to the cabinet makers. We'll be fine there. And here's the thing is, you say the those cabinets look high end to me. People don't want to use hemp because it's cheap. That's where I think a, a big mis, misnomer is. People want to use hemp because it's green and it sucks up a lot of carbon. And so, great, let's go sell hemp cabinets to high-end families who will pay top dollars for the same thing that you'd put into a marijuana shop because they make a lot of money. And I think we would do very well. And so, for everybody that makes a product, there are people that will pay top dollar. I love uh, Curtis. If you've ever heard him talk, I know he's on here, but Curtis talks about concrete not as being a cheaper product, but a product that reduces greenhouse gas by 21%. 21%. It's crazy to me. And so uh, it, it's, it's probably more as a whole, but uh, concrete uh, cement is 28% of the total greenhouse gas and 21% to 8, 8 or 9%, three, two thirds of the amount is massive. And so people will actually pay more to do those types of things. And I think a lot of people just miss that. And so I'd love to uh, get into cabinets. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So our factory had a net negative carbon footprint of 4,100 tons last year because we actually use our waste and create our energy for the plant. So when you talk about taking carbon out of the atmosphere, um, we're doing it. All we have to do is just write down the numbers that are actually happening with it. Okay, so I'm so impressed. And with that, I want to turn over real quick. I started another group that is about carbon sequestering and sustainability, and it's on June 1st. Um, I dropped the registration links, um, or my helper did, Fern, drop the um, education or, or the links for the um, carbon sequestering meeting. But I encourage all of you to attend as we start talking about this, really diving into what are the numbers and what can the farmer, what can the whole production line, right, the entire supply chain uh, count on, or where should we be at as an industry um, on our carbon footprint? So I, I put that out there. And then tomorrow we have a group for at two o'clock that meets. It's our education group and um, uh, it's about uh, biofuel. So, okay, on with that. Had to throw that plug. <laughs> okay, so other questions that I'd love to open up. Anything um, on the production side? Omar, I saw your. Camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, yeah, my name is uh, Omar. I'm with uh, Crew Capital. Uh, we're in investment bank. Um, this is uh, my uh, first uh, uh, meeting or participation. Uh, met, talked to La uh, Mandy just earlier in the week, um, and uh, but uh, uh, very interested in this space. Uh, I am new, but I do come from the renewable energy and sustainable. Um, industry and have uh, have a pretty good handle on uh, the finance of uh, renewables and sustainable type of uh, industries. Have lots of contacts. Uh, you know, I, I put together uh, uh, different uh, financing facilities uh, from uh, t tax credit structures and making use of those, and have lots of, lots of resources. So I'm just starting to get, you know obviously very new to this. Uh, trying to get my arms around it all, uh, hoping to to make some contacts. Uh, Aaron, I'll definitely be reaching out to to you to get a little bit of direction. But um, my my question is is is, um, is is there a committee or anything? I know Mandy. I mean that uh, just focuses on on the fi the financing of things uh, that you know, just revolves around. Uh, that and helping with policy and get, and uh, where I can go to kind of get my arms around you know what what incentives are out there for this space. No, I don't have one set up for that yet. <laughs> I feel like I have. I mean, I do eight eight to twelve of these a month, yeah. but I would love to entertain that and put something together. I have on 
our side started gathering all of the links for grants and resources and started putting committees or meetings together to digest different resources. Um, but I would love to put together a almost a steering committee as to what topics we want to talk about or address. Yeah, um, definitely. I, like, yeah, likewise, I, I welcome any uh, any folks out there that have insight to that. I'll yeah. drop my contact info, and so if somebody wants to reach out, uh, yeah. I'm delighted to collaborate and um, see how I can uh, you know, help out here with uh, this perfect. exciting stuff. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions? We're at an hour now. Um, I'm happy to stay on. I would love to continue to highlight as many of you or you know open this up for discussion. I if if you guys have specific questions. John, I know you have logged off for a second and are back on. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to share or any insight on the construction and building side. Oh, you know, just uh, been doing the research with uh, the World Center for Concrete Technology since way back in like 2004. Um, there's some exciting opportunities there using the World Center and um, and just tying together a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things. I, I would really be interested in seeing the details of uh, structural building plans as a contractor. Uh, there, we have some buildings we'll be putting up, and I want to. I'd like to use one of these sent building systems. Um, so it'd be good. I'd like to just dive more into it for industrial applications and building. Well, and I, I, you have a lot of experience in this. And going after the textile side, what has been so fascinating is the partnership that has been um, happening into the construction and building materials, right? And what that looks like, that the herd and the what is once waste or would be waste for the textile or garment industry is definitely the prime product. And so, yeah, I don't know if you want to. I'm I'm looking for things like uh, how we structurally load the buildings, how they have earthquake prevented you know, measures in their designs, those sort of things. You know, if it can be dry stacked or if it's going to be mortared, uh, how we apply veneers, how we put uh, stone on the outside or brick, or how how other things, how the normal kind of fascia that we like to see on homes, how that can happen too. And then uh, I don't know the the verdict's out. I think it, it's really interesting to see. I think the market's definitely there in a big way. We know how big it is, and we know that we have a really amazing habit of of continuing construction. We will not stop as a as humans. We just have to construct, even in the worst of times. We still construct. So I don't see the market slowing down. It's cost of movement from one location to the market, either from the fields or two markets. So transportation could be a killer cost here as we see gas prices rise. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see. But uh, ulti ultimately, uh, you know, we're looking at trying to help the World Center for Concrete Technology build a new portion of their campus and showcase everything that we've got. Everybody that's here have a portion of that World Center that's the new hemp annex of the uh, World Center for Concrete Technology. And they're they're games. They they want to see this happen. We'd love to make it happen. I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. I think too. And we look at building materials. There's a little bit about the history of hemp in America, and we've got like Kent Masterson Brown that's doing the history of hemp. So if you know anything or any tidbits, if you've got interesting pieces of machinery, I'd say reach out to Kent Masterson Brown. Either sponsor the film or be a part of it because it's going to be a really interesting story about the history of hemp in America done for PBS. So we want to make sure we found all the resources. We found some uh, hemp study that was done here in Montana using at a military base that no longer exists here. They're back in 1914 to 1919. And then we haven't done research until 2018. So a long gap in between. Uh, a lot of good things. I think the challenges are going to be weight, getting the weight of our hemp products down so that we have a, a competitive advantage over wood, in addition to hopefully the price over wood, but also. Uh, some some building advantages where we can ship it further and we'll have um, you know obviously a, hopefully a lower production cost on a per unit basis yeah well um just on that point john i mean if you want to have a look at our website there there are some um information you can download about uh, how all of the veneer applications are applied and also the uh, load bearing system as well plus uh, yeah, quite happy to supply uh, testing information and uh, we sort of we sort of also have an architectural 
uh, design and engineering support service as well. Um, so, yeah, happy to have a chat about uh, you know, any projects you might have going and uh, how we might be able to fit in and, uh, you know, help you to better understand what we're doing, at least anyway. Are we, are we using any of the uh, hemp blocks uh, below grade? Are we doing any below grade applications are you using that? What, what do you mean below grade? I don't... Below grade, below ground level, but going no, underground. No, no, absolutely not. We had an inquiry with somebody who wanted to do something under the ocean for salmon farms and went, no, <laughs> it's, it's for above ground stuff, absolutely. Right. I didn't know if we can build like the basement, if you could start down on the foundation and come all the way up and build your basement walls and then backfill against it. No, not in our experience. I don't know about you, Terry, but uh, no, but definitely all hemp blocks are above ground or hemp creeks above ground. Yeah, that's correct, uh, uh, Glenn and uh, John. We, we, uh, we've developed a below grade product using uh, not using hemp. It's using our same technology, but we've uh, gone to recyclables, either soy-based uh, um, like foam materials, things like that. So we're all about sustainability and renewability. That's what our, our our business is based on. So we do have materials for below grade and they're uh, like super insulating R60, R70 uh, and load bearing up to like 90 MPA. So we can address that, okay. but it's not a hemp based product. It's not. Okay. Well, give me, give me a shout or send me a, an email, uh, John, and I can um, give you more info on, on, on that. Very well, Terry. Thank you. Um, this is Marnie Coy. Um, did you say, I'm sorry, I missed a little bit. Did you say that you were interested in like historical research on him? Yeah, I think anything that's related to uh, the history uh, in our states, in the United States anyway. I know we have people from around the world here, but the uh, it's the history of hemp in America that Kent Masterson Brown is uh, shooting. And then what they do is he has a group that uh, reenacts a lot of the scenes about the important parts of history that um, you know, that happened back in the history of hemp. And then that's a part of the, the segments, but it's, it's an opportunity. It's PBS type advertising, you know, so you have to know, you don't just get to run an advertisement in it, but you get the, you know, paid for by so-and-so. You get okay. the mentions. If I and, remember. and it's a once in a lifetime chance too. Okay. If I remember correctly, I can't remember what it was exactly, but if I remember correctly, I think somebody said that USDA had information from, you know, when hemp was legal in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, yep. and so if you could get your hands on some of that, that might be interesting. Sure. I mean, I've there's uh, guys doing a lot of research, uh, Dan Eisenstein and uh, uh, a few others that are helping uh, Kent, you know, do that research. He has a whole team of people, too, that are helping. So I just think if you had something or if you know of something, uh, you know, let's bring it out because it would be forever lost you know if it didn't get into that history film it'll be what's used in our schools it's going to be used all over the place so it'll yeah, be a feature okay. film but it's going to be broken into little segments that'll make it make its way into our classrooms so okay. we want to make sure it's accurate and it has as best a picture of america's hemp world you know there's buildings my grandfather used to work at a place called cleveland cordage and i i'm looking through family albums to see if i can find a picture of cleveland cordage there in cleveland ohio where they made ropes yeah, that's that's very cool. I and that's why I sort of think of the USDA because it is a government agency, and so the things it kind of gives you a perspective on how things have changed and the perspective has changed, you know, at the federal level between then and now, and what has happened in between. So it's just a different perspective, uh, just for historical context. Sure. Artie, I see one, you're not. I see you're not on mute anymore, Artie. Are you? Yes, uh, I'm. Happy to introduce myself, Artie Yonquist with Empower Unity today. You'll be uh, seeing um, also my contact info ties me back to another company that I work with called Rhodes Harbor. But I was just had a quick question for John. Do you know a potential air date for that documentary? I think it's uh, two years, about oh, okay. probably two years. They'll be doing reenactments all over the course of the next year and a half or so. And they'll go, I don't have the exact production schedule, but Kent and it's called witnessing history. If you go into it, you can see all the other examples of witnessing history. And it's amazing. Daniel Boone, the history of booze in Kentucky. It's all kinds of cool stuff. 
Well, I'm I'm excited to learn of it. Um, you, many of you will be learn. All of you will eventually be learning of what Empower Unity is intending to do, which is um, help bring us all together in a bigger, better way to uh, secure the and create, if you will, a national hemp reserve of funding that will allow us and empower us to do many great projects and come together as a bigger, better team to stand up this national hemp industry. When you think about what JFK did in launching a uh, plan to put a man on the moon in 10 years. And we look what we did with the Hemp for Victory campaign in World War II. We now at Empower Unity think that it's not unrealistic to say with the right harnessing of the right Yankee ingenuities represented on this call today that within the next 24 months, we can make a big dent in doing many great things. And when you think of the current crises for housing, affordable housing, homelessness, all of us on this call today in Zoom session represent uh, very powerful minds of people that are ready to come together and work together to address that one specific issue. And so it's very exciting to think of what you have started, Mandy, and uh, we are excited. And I know everybody else is excited. And with crypto backed currency coin, blockchain technology and other ways, um, there are many, many options as to how we can bring funding together in a bigger, better way that will empower people to just unleash their talents and not be bound restricted by lack of funding to do anything because we all have very powerful minds and we just want to put those minds to good use. Thank you. Bruce, I saw your your hand is up too. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mandy. Um, Bruce here. Um, John, I'm uh, really intrigued about uh, this Kent uh, Masterson Brown. Do uh, you know, uh, is he already familiar with uh, Doc Harrer's book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, The Whole History uh, of oh, yeah. and I'm sure he would Of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. If he, if he wasn't, then I'm going to make sure that he uh, was. So. Hey, yeah. all of you, reach out to him. Give him a little uh, boost of support. I was the first sponsor for the film when he announced it here about a year ago. So join, join my company and let's go. <laughs> Very cool. I'm excited to see all the film and video that's coming out the documentary i mean there have been a number of people that have now been recording you know, years worth of the stories the hemp story um i'm just excited to see it start coming out it's been fascinating. we're gonna have we'll also have about three thousand troops that are transitioning home now from uh, afghanistan area and uh, one of those programs is called ground forces and it's all about them shooting films in agriculture when they transition back Cool. Very cool. Hey, uh, I got a question for Joel. There, you're doing stuff in uh, Trinidad and Tobago, yeah? Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. How's it going over there? I'm interested to know what you're up to. Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Joel Mitchell. Um, currently, I'm looking to bring hemp into the Caribbean in a major way by restructuring the agricultural sector in the Caribbean. Um, what I am embarking upon is really pushing the mandate of change in the terms of climate change. Now, we see climate change affecting every single one of us to this date, on this face of this earth. So what I'm embarking upon is really pushing the envelope of growing the hemp and using it in two major areas, which is agriculture broken up in construction and animal feed. What is happening in Trinidad and Tobago is that we consume, we are the consumers of, we are, we are actually third in the list of poultry consumption in the world behind United States and Israel. So we consume a lot of poultry. So there was a test done by the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago showing the viability of the seeds. So it's very helpful to the animals. Now, the feed that they are using is heated. So there's some form of synthetic used in the feed. So it pushes heat. But the natural feed, which is the organic side, which we know is the hemp seeds, is very, very healthy to the animals. And it's, it's been studied, and because it was so successful, the university and the, the patrons that took part in it wanted it to be done a second time. 
they did not push for it. So this is where I come in with my entities and we're pushing with this esteemed gentleman here who is going to be helping me further along the lines of really bringing this to the forefront. As we speak right now, the price of cement has doubled in my country because of the pandemic. So it used to be at least $67, $60 ET. Now it's $120. So you see the viability of, of the industry growing in the Caribbean. I'm also embarking on a 600-acre um, here towards ecotourism. So that's the other project. So once we start the pilot project here in Trinidad and Tobago, we're going to start building through the rest of the Caribbean in, in really bringing the construction alive. So, awesome. Okay, well, thanks, Robert. I saw you, your face is showing now. I'm glad to see you on. Would you like to introduce yourself? For those that don't know Mr. Ziner. Hi, uh, Mandy. It's great to be here as always. Uh, my name is Robert Ziner with Canadian Industrial Hemp Corporation. We've developed and patented an AI-driven uh, hemp stock processing and optimization solution. Uh, we've been focused for the last uh, 16 months on product development, market development, and our primary focus will be on the biocomposite uh, products. Uh, again, as others have said, Mandy, you've done an amazing job. It's uh, really a uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity and benefit to be able to uh, hear so many uh, committed, uh, interesting, interested, and knowledgeable people talk about the opportunity. So I'm, I'm just delighted to be here, and thank you again. Well, thanks. I appreciate you. Um, I'm excited. We have a presentation actually coming up here pretty soon where um, Bobby is going to present on what he's doing, what he's working on, the opportunity in the industry. Um, and so forth. So give an opportunity to really dive into a Q&A session um, and so forth. Is there anybody else that would like to jump in? Would like to share anything, ask any questions before we sign off? Go ahead, Bobby. I saw your hands up again. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm also very interested to hear from this broad array of people across you know, the States and Canada and other places you know, just what their own pulse is, in a sense, for uh, the market uh, of, you know, the market of 2021. I was talking to a, uh, a farmer today in North Carolina, and he was explaining to me that they're anticipating that there'll be a reduction of about uh, 25 to 30 percent of uh, hemp grown in North Carolina, um, you know, from a uh, balancing uh, between supply and demand, it may not be a bad thing and it may add some, some stability. I'm just curious what other people um, around the country, around uh, the continent have been, you know, their own perception, just a perception thing. What have people been saying and what they think is going to happen in 2021? Good question. Well, I mean, I see a transition from uh, a lot more acreage into industrial hemp rather than CBD. Uh, especially for us, which is good because, I mean, we don't want to, um, I suppose, uh, you know, start manufacturing if there's not enough supply there. So there seems to be an oversupply of CBD um, type uh, plants or acreage. And uh, I don't know, from a lot of the uh, discussions that I've had with various growers and other enterprises around the United States, people are now starting to focus on industrial hemp because, they're, as we've said before, there seems to be more of a market for that, um, for the CBD market. As far as acreage goes, seems to be saturated, but you know, I stand to be corrected. And just to correct myself, uh, Glennon, it wasn't a farmer actually, it was a seed distributor. Uh, that's why I was, uh, you know, it wasn't just a question of whether CBD or whatever. Um, I think the reality is a lot of farmers have been bitten twice, um, probably more than that, have been bitten once. So I'm just curious, really, with the pulses. I mean, on a personal note, I don't mind committing myself to the fact that I don't believe you'll see anything close to stability uh, in the industrial hemp opportunity till 2023, till the crop of 2023. 
I think that everybody's kind of, uh, you know, getting their sense of where they are, where the industry is, where the opportunities are. And I think that causes people to tread slowly um, or sometimes more carefully and sometimes not carefully enough. That's just my thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we need about a thousand acres of hemp for uh, one uh, manufacturing facility. It's not a great deal. And that, well, and I heard some pretty small numbers for even what's being produced now. Um, yeah, yeah. Greg had some smaller numbers. Yeah. What What's your perspective, you guys? I, I know Marin and John. And well, I you know going to the NoCo show, um, I saw nothing but uh, the uh, investor day was nothing but bullish investors. Every single state, you can grow the day, you can grow it everywhere. So there's investors in every state, and they all want a piece of the action. So it was a very bullish environment, I would say. Uh, Montana approved horse uh, feed for the seed cake here recently. So we can do hemp with horses now. We're going to be able to do cows really soon. And it's going to be a game changer for us. We went from 55,000 acres to 13,000 acres. You know, so we definitely went down here over the last year. But we're on the rise. And uh, we have 5.5 million acres of wheat. We grow the highest quality wheat in the world in Montana. I can only imagine we're going to be in the millions of acres of hemp fairly soon in just the next few years. And most of it's going to be driven by our cows. We have three times as many cows as people. <laughs> you know, I mean, the reality is, is that's the biggest, the, the, I think the brightest part of it. I think the other big brightest part is uh, we're seeing a huge growth in organics. Uh, people want organic flour. They want organic seed. It's the best, highest value crop you can have and it's organic so we should all be making a and planning our systems to be uh, certified organic or making the transition that's Mary. the big opportunity i would say yeah th there's also the opportunity for soil remediation as well yeah right. absolutely no, that's, got that's that's not going to fall in the organic category but we can clean up a lot of farmland and get that carbon sequestration as well um i think you're dead on we're going to we're going to really launch hemp and fiber. I've, I've actually said it since they started farming uh, hemp seven years ago. We uh, we catered to the CBD market because that was honestly the only thing that was even a, remotely going to fund the ranch and the farm that we were operating. Uh, but as as we move forward, the explosion and as you mentioned, you know, um, no co expo. We've got. Uh, uh, a thousand CBD companies, and uh, a lot of them actually aren't doing very well because of the glut in the market. Uh, but as we move forward, uh, there's processing facilities going in everywhere. Montana, I believe, I think Melissa's on here from Kansas. They just set up a decortication line. We've got Texas online. Nebraska's coming soon. Iowa is extremely excited. Just did a great thing. Minnesota's kind of been quiet. There's a lot going on in Minnesota with fiber. Uh, it, we're really starting to see it launch. Unfortunately, this year, uh, corn prices and soy prices have hurt us a bit on production. Hard to convince a farmer not to grow corn when he's getting seven bucks a bushel versus three last year. So uh, a few challenges there, but the, the feed thing, I think, will definitely push things forward. As you mentioned, that the protein levels are insane on this on these seeds, mm -hmm. and uh, we can have healthier, happier cows. And you know, we're still going to have to do something with that fiber that the uh, grain crops were grown on so it's it's really exciting times actually uh 2023 might be when things stabilize a little more but you know you've got greg that's already been doing the hemp wood for a couple of years we're, we're fighting new applications for that every day and it's just a really exciting time to be in this industry actually it's it's really cool greg i saw your hand is up and then after greg go ahead eric but go ahead greg. well am i muted no. You're good. I can hear um, you. <laughs> well, Mandy is a good facilitator because you prompted me to introduce myself a little bit if I felt like it. I have talked to some, a couple people on this call and I'm, I'm reaching out to others. So I'm just taking an opportunity to introduce myself because um, I, I came into cannabis as a brain scientist and a pharmacologist. I've been on the cannabis as medicine, cannabinoids side of things as a researcher, then a tenured college professor in biology starting one of the medical cannabis companies in Florida and working in industrial hemp extraction, again, all on the cannabinoid side. 
I'm starting a venture now um, with a colleague, a dear old friend who's a PhD economist. And um, what we're working on is um, not working on half and are launching is a software based platform to be another commodities exchange focused entirely on hemp based products. And I'm so excited to be getting on this side of the angle. And I know I have some good friends who have been in hemp materials and fibers for many years. Um, and I understand the biology of cannabis very, very well. Um, so I'm just looking to build more connections. Again, I've been reaching out to some of the folks, um, even like Bobby, who's just talked, we had a great call. Um, I just am excited to think about these possibilities. And I keep asking questions about some of these questions about specifications. I mean, with will there be a grade A, B, and C hemp fiber um, in order to help you know, commodifying the market. I think of things like rotation crops and people planting hemp just for soil remediation, uh, for example, or to get good uh, crop rotations and helping them find uh, good markets, helping match buyers to sellers. It's a new realm for me, but not new to the folks I'm teaming up with, who I think we have solved a problem that other exchanges haven't quite gotten. Um, and, and just like so many people are saying, there's so much room in manufacturing. There's, there's many different rooms to have different marketplaces for exchange. And if this industry is going to get to the place where hemp is reaching towards its potential of being in so many different products, um, then uh, there's got to be new innovation to help those markets uh, get supported and launch. And, and I'm just super stoked. I've moved back to Nashville where I did my PhD work 20 years ago in cannabis and helping to discover the endocannabinoid system. And, um, and, and now I'm just ready to launch this. So please reach out to me. Our company's called NashX. You'll be seeing me sort of posting some things out. And Jake Waddell, I've got, I'm trying to make an appointment to talk to you next Tuesday. There's an email in your box. Russ Zavitson reached out to you. Oh, so, yeah. um, Awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited because I was listening to you talk. I was texting uh, Lee and Russ saying, "Do Jake is somebody to tune into?" Because the, the <laughs> building, the the building industry, the, the uh, has got to be a key leg of what we're trying to to network with and build here. And I'm I'm excited. I'm per I love brain pharmacology and the cannabinoids, and I will never leave it. And our, my vision is for this marketplace to expand to that. But we are focusing our uh, at least our start on the materials and industrial part. That's where growth is explosive. It's where hemp can really have a huge impact. And I'm a little tired of all the circles you run in. Some of the excitement, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox in a second, but some of the excitement I hear on this call um, reminds me of being in the medical marijuana movements in the late 90s. Um, and when I've been in medical marijuana circles in Latin America in the last 10 years, where you've got this energy and hope for something happening that can really start changing the world. And, um, and I'm, I'm eager to be in part of this. Uh, my, I'll put my contact in the chat and then I'll let somebody else speak. And thanks so much. You're awesome. Thank you very much. And I would love to help, you know, bring this together. Again, for those that maybe weren't on in the beginning, it's why we built this is to bring people together to help make introductions and collaborate with organizations like U.S. Employees Association and some of these others. So I welcome and I encourage you guys to please continue to invite people to attend, um, continue to have these discussions, and really open and broaden our networks. Eric, it's all you. <laughs> hey, Mandy, thanks a lot for uh, yeah. for the overtime as well and for everyone that stayed on. Um, so my name is Eric Mugini, if anyone hasn't met me already. Uh, basically, Mandy could tell you how many times I'm always pitching here. Is, uh, no, uh, it's great. <laughs> I know, right? Thank you. I feel like I'm getting worse over the years, but I mean, but thank you. Um, so no, basically, uh, uh, I'm targeting all hemp farmers nationwide uh, for a biostimulant product to help them grow better, healthier, cleaner plants. Or if they're also remediating, we have a program to help remediate the soil all in one grow. Um, we'll, Love to reach out and have anyone talk about that. What my farming target market ties into building is what was mentioned earlier that um, I've been hearing that a lot of smaller, easier to approach uh, operations have been getting bit in the last two years with the crash of the CBD pricing. I guess it has to do something with the raise in the marijuana market. Not sure. So um, my question is, um, most of you are also in the in the business of buying this hemp. 
what would by when do you think the market someone said 2023 but do you think that maybe by 2022 we'll see a better stabilization for prices in hemp as this ties into uh, my end clients too so i think there's a synergy there for a successful hemp farmer out there just looking for those tidbits of information thanks Anybody? I, I, I mean, as far as price competitive. Yeah, I could repeat the question if you want in a bit different format too. Sorry. No, it was pretty straightforward, Eric. Um, it's going to stabilize uh, every day. Uh, a lot of people that are growing fiber this year already have their crops sold. Uh, it, there's there's end uses for this material as we speak, um, and and I think that it's going to stabilize as far as uh, if you look at Old Dominion hemp, for example. I believe they make the animal bedding. Uh, I believe they went from like $20 a bale to $60 a bale. Um, so we're actually probably seeing a shortage. Uh, I can't really think any other reason where that price would jump so much other than they're like, yeah, if you want this stuff, you're going to pay for it. So I, th I think you're going to see a steady growth. And obviously there's guys that uh, want to, um, you know, make it a commodity and that will stabilize things. But as the market's driving right now, I mean, Greg knows what he needs for a log uh, for his hemp wood. Uh, so he needs to feed that machine. Uh, franchise operations for Greg would need to be fed with hemp as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, we're going to see a, a nice steady curve of stabilization. I mean, when you see the activity going on in, in grain and fiber this year, it's just night and day. It's almost like CBD doesn't exist, which, yeah, I mean, Honestly, nobody yeah. needs to grow. Nobody needs to grow CBD this year. It's crazy. It's crazy. Still going to the event, seeing so many heavily populated. I mean, they're all still CBD. Oh, I stopped going to the CBD shows. You don't sell any yeah. CBD at CBD shows. You sell it at home shows and farm shows. And yeah, it's kind of funny because our our home goods actually exit our CBD line really nice at like a home show or. Uh, we did a couple of ag shows in Iowa and Nebraska this uh, February, and it was so cool to see the farmers grabbing the, the the products that we made and like, wow, this is made from hemp, and we can we can grow this and we can make this stuff, and we don't have to kill trees. Uh, and then then they then they talk about their sore elbow, and we sell them a little thing of ball, you know. But but yeah, the CBD market it's it's pretty tough these days. Definitely uh, thinning out the herd, if you will. Okay, so real quick, I want to introduce Tyler. Tyler, I saw your screen is on. I think you've got something great that to offer and a great asset to add. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Mandy. Th thanks for putting this together. What an incredible uh, group of uh, awesome minds here. Um, grateful to be a part of it. I just wanted to sort of introduce myself. Uh, I'm Tyler Ammerman. I work for a firm called Gannett Fleming. Uh, we're, we're about 105 years old. Uh, architecture, engineering, design, construction firm. Um, we operate on a national scale, um, also present in Canada. And so um, I just wanted to uh, kind of reach out and say, hey, we're, we're available to support facility design, all disciplines of, of PE and architecture. Um, I know Artie. Hey, Artie, how you doing? Uh, a couple other folks on here as well. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, make myself available as, as folks are looking for uh, places to go, places to build. We can start you from phase one. Um, you know, uh, review processes through um, all, all util utilities, um, scaling up, uh, facility design, implementation, uh, procurement, and construction. We don't design your process. We don't tell you how to do what you do. Uh, we build the facility to support what you are good at. So um, I'll, I'll drop my info in the chat there and feel free to reach out. I'm happy to speak with anybody about it. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. I think it's something that we skip over so often in, yeah. in you know, it, discussions. That all these all the all of the industry events that I go to, we wind up being the only design build, the only engineering firm there that's not related to process, to but the supporting entity that is essential. I and mean, you can't build you can't build these facilities, any process facility, without PEs, uh, without uh, electrical engineers, without folks to to design them and, and make sure they're. Uh, you know, whether it's a GMP space, obviously that's not exactly this conversation, but, you know, there's different factors of, of, um, of hazard analysis and room designations and air handling and, um, you know, uh, distributed gases, uh, utility loads, all that stuff that's just got, it's got to be figured out some way. And so um, we're here to support uh, this industry uh, as much as we can. 
Awesome. Thank, thank, thank you. John, I saw you were back off mute. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add before we turn it over. Or anyone else that has questions, please don't hesitate to chime in. Well, uh, I put a, a screen thing behind me here because I'm a, the vice president of the Organic Marketing Association. If you go to organiceatme.com, there's a bunch of hemp t-shirts that are printed on organic, um, organic cotton in this case. We don't have the organic hemp t-shirts yet, but uh, organiceatme.com is some really cool ideas. You can put your businesses into that, but a little last plug. Okay. Thanks, Mandy. Great job. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Yep. Okay, so tomorrow's meeting is about biofuels. Um, there are some smart minds. I always laugh because last time I had Ahmed on talking with Vinny, Brian said, well, I can hear the words, but I don't know what they're saying. And that's kind of, I'm a little nervous about tomorrow's discussion because there are just certain things I don't know and don't understand. But incredibly smart people joining us tomorrow to present about biofuels. So if you guys would like to join, please feel free. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for today. And, uh, nice to meet uh, people, and I've been connecting while we've been uh, talking. So, look forward to uh, having conversations and see what we can all what, what damage we can do to the uh, not damage, but you know, damage as far as uh, making good damage. <laughs> That's right, absolutely, Jacob. I really appreciate you joining as well. Thank you. I'd love to find ways we can collaborate and continue to do these and bring your knowledge. Um, it's you know, I don't claim claim to be the expert, but I claim to connect you guys as experts. So um, if there's anything I can do or anything our organization can do to support you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time. I love making connections. I'm passionate about connecting you guys and watching your businesses grow. Um, I need you guys and us to create opportunities for all of our kids to change the world. So that's why, we're, why I'm here. <laughs> well, thank you very thank much, you. you guys. We'll see you next time. Uh, Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you, guys.